Hello! In this video, we're going to recreate this map visualization of historic trademarks in the UK using D3JS. The boundaries you see here are UK postal areas, and for each one we have labeled or filled in the area uh, its oldest registered trademark. So that comes either in the form of a word, phrase, or an image. The data and imagery here came from the Intellectual Property Office which maintains a register of all the trademarks filed in the UK since 1876. In my previous video, we stepped through downloading the full register data, import it into SQLite, and then using the um, SQLite browser to uh, explore and have a look through the full data set. And then we run a few queries to extract the historical data that we wanted for this visualization. Now, if you'd like to follow along with those data gathering and preparation steps, go take a look at that video first. Picking up where we left off in the last video, we produced this JSON file with the trademark details and data that we need to accompany each of the postal code areas here. So in this JSON file for each area, we've got the oldest trademark and details about it. So AB here, that's, uh, that's I think that's Aberdeen. And you have the published date, the name of uh, I believe this is not the name of the trademark, but the name of the company, um, the trademark text, and that'll be the text of a, a basically the text trade, trademark, or it might be the text that appears in the image of a trademark as well. Um, and here we have a link back to the entry on the IPO site itself, which we're gonna use um, to get the image that we need for each of these entries. We're going to start by using this blank map template that I've linked to in the show notes so you can follow along. It shows a map of the UK with lines around those postal area boundaries. I'll walk through the code just now so we can set the scene for our work creating this visualization. In the head, we have some basic style information that's not too important right now. Um, and then next in the markup, we have a place to put our visualization. So we've got the section with the idea of viz and then um, actually the SVG element with an idea of canvas. And in the footer, I've added some um, accreditation and links. Next, we import the D3 and topo JSON library, which is uh, what we're gonna use to create this. And into the actual uh, JavaScript, we start as ever, I guess, um, by defining the size of our canvas, uh, canvas um, <clears throat> which is set to the width and height of our window. Here we define the projection and pass in some geographic and centering details. To briefly explain what projection does, it takes geographic coordinates and turns them into pixel coordinates and that we need to register render stuff to the screen. The scale parameter here, and um, I've set a scale variable, defines how big we want the map to be. I've based this on the size of the area and multiplied um, by this so one point, it's just, it's just arbitrary value, value um, which I actually just came up with by trial and error. Setting it to one was too small, so I went for this. Um, it's pretty much just what looked good on my, on my screen. Um, and note at this point, we're not really taking into account aspect ratios or whether someone you know you've resized a window or you may have um, a different orientation for portrait devices and all that so it was just based on what looks okay on my laptop at the moment in my finished my finished visualization i added some code around to react to different aspect ratios and screen sizes and whatnot but i'm not really going to focus on that in this video. So next we generate this uh, path definer function using the above projection. Now in an SVG map like we have here, each of the boundaries will be rendered using a path element. As paths can be any arbitrary shape, um, it's, a, it's a precisely the useful element for, um, for, for drawing maps like this. So if we take a look at, if we inspect one of these elements, 
you'll see here, I've got lots of groups. Let me expand this somewhat so we know what we're looking at here. We've got our document, there's the SVG. I've got a group for all the areas in there. And within that, there are lo lots of nodes um, and there's a group basically for each boundary. And notice there is the D attribute here and that's where we get our shape description. And that's what the path definer function does or, or sort of path function is what a lot of people call it in, in, uh, in D3 code, you'll see that quite a lot. So we pass in geographic information and that will spit out that uh, SVG path shape description. Now we haven't actually got to the code that will append any of those path elements yet. The first thing that we need to do is to fetch the map data. So we do this with a D3 JSON function, um, D3 dot JSON function, passing the URL uh, to the JSON file, which is in the topo JSON format. Fetching is asynchronous, so we need to wait until the data comes back before we can do anything with it. Once it comes back to us, we have this function, uh, an anonymous function with a sole argument UK, and that has all the uh, geographic details. The first thing we do when that comes back is to create this uh, areas group, which is the which is a group basically just to append all our, uh, our, our boundaries to, so something to keep all the geographic information contained in one group to organize our elements a bit better. The next thing that we do is to append our groups that will be will contain those path elements that you saw there. So we'll, we'll, we perform what in the language of D3 is called the data join. We join the group elements with topo JSON features. So for each topo JSON feature, we create a group and pair that with uh, and pair that with that boundary information. Well, in topo JSON, it's called a feature. Um, so each one will represent a UK postal area. Let's switch away from the code and take a look at that JSON file uh, so that you have an idea of what this is actually pairing to those elements. UK postal areas, JSON, yeah. All right, let me collapse these and opening the file, you'll see there are four top level key value pairs. Now, the main bit I'd like to show you is in objects, areas, and we have this geometry collection. And this is where the different boundaries are defined. Crucially, if you look at one of these geometry elements, you can see there's a properties key. And for each one, we have um, a, a postal area code. So this one, AB, is for the Aberdeen region. Uh, this one with the sole letter, I think there's one here, down here. Yeah, this one with the sole letter B, that's for Birmingham, and so on and so forth. So let's go back to our JavaScript code. Okay. So we're calling topo JSON here to help D3 understand that format. Now we have a collection of groups with accompanying feature data. We haven't added the paths yet. We've just got groups. That's what we do down here. So we call append and then set the D attribute by passing in that path definer function. Notice there's no need to write a loop here. I didn't have to say uh, for each boundary group append path and I have to actually type in dot for each and call that method. The append function is kind of clever in that it implicitly appends a path for every one of those groups that we have uh, data bound to. Now that data is used when we set the d attribute for these paths. 
So uh, those those path elements each get their shape description by passing the bound top position feature data into the path definer function we generated earlier, right? So this is this is kind of like a callback when it's iterating through, it will get past that feature data. All of those paths are collected in this area path variable. And then finally, we append a title element and set the text to that property, the first property key we find in there, uh, name. So we also use, as I should have mentioned, that we also use this to set the ID attribute of those groups. So that will help us uh, find the group containing um, any particular region that we may want to uh, select to perhaps bind events, click events and that sort of thing or hover events or, or that sort of thing. So we're able to find it later on. Appending that title element provides the tooltip when I go over, this is the standard browser tooltip, when I go over to the map and then I, I hover over. So there's our AB, and B, Birmingham's here somewhere. Yeah, so that concludes our walkthrough for this uh, starter template. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is to now fetch that historical uh, trademarks data set that we extracted from the full uh, registrations. To do so, we're going to use the same method that we have used here to fetch the geographic and boundary data. We're going to call d3.json. I'm going to nest that fetch within this first uh, geographic data fetch. So we're going to go off and get that data when, um, when we've drawn our boundaries already as uh, it doesn't make sense to be doing anything until that's done um, so now we've got uh, our trademarks in this uh, trademark uh, trademarks data in this trademarks uh, variable which I think is just a collection an array now for each one of these trademarks I'm going to select that boundary group, so anonymous function, paste that in. And what this does is it gives me that, uh, it gives me that group I've based on the ID there. And for each one, I'm going to append a text element setting the text to the value of the trade the trademark text right so I think that's trademark mark text that's what we had in our JSON file right um, for later styling I'll give it a class of mark text and so we can style that in CSS. And as you can see, this uh, preview here, it's, it's not appearing anywhere, right? We need to give it X and Y coordinates. So let's say X 100. Uh, and oops, attribute Y 100. Append text, trademark marks text. So we've selected the boundary group. We append text, I've marked text. So that should be, they should be floating around somewhere, right? But they're away off center, right? Let's see, 200, 200. Uh, I see what's going on here. So that was uppercase, right? So if I change that, what happens is 
um, we they're all positioned in the same place, right? We need to position them over the kind of center point of each of those boundaries. So uh, we're going to need to use some of the geographic information to uh, position to position these elements. Now, to do that, we are going to make use of the I think we need to use the path definer and the centroid function. So what we need to do is provide the path definer function which has um, our projection information with the accompanying geographic boundary data. So calling an element uh, calling dot datum on an element will get that uh, accompanying or paired data with uh, from from the element, right? So boundary group has our top adjacent feature details. We're passing that into centroid. Now we get a x y coordinate uh, in boundary center. So boundary center, if that is correct, zero should be the x, and y should be Number one, uh, sorry, uh, Y should be the second index. So there we go, it's uh, it's now appearing. It looks a bit ugly still, but we'll come back and, and deal with that in a moment. Um, so we have a little bit of work to do in terms of scaling those, uh, those text elements down to um, an appropriate size for the boundary itself and to try and maybe um, <clears throat> prevent them from like overlapping each other. So there's a bit of resizing to do. At the moment, the font size is set to, let's see here, it's set to uh, compute 16, 16 pixels, right? Um, if I bring this font size down to say 10 picks, uh, we're getting a bit better. 10 could maybe be the maximum, um, five, but we could adjust the font size based on the length of the text, for example. Um, so the way that you could do that is to have, uh, it's called attribute or I uh, know, sorry, style and set style of the font size and in just a, we could hard code it right five picks so we've got down to five picks now if we want to make it dynamic based on the length of the mark text itself then we would need to do something like this so we've got length and return uh, picks. Now that is going to make the the big ones bigger, right? So it's um, the other way around, right? We want to maybe use division here. So say 15 or 16 um, and then that makes for um, what does this do? Yeah, that, that, that kind of works. We'll come back to this. I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is very fiddly and really it's a lot of manual tweaking to get the right sizes of things. Now that all works very well enough for our text trademarks, but we want to see some nice pictures. Our boundaries are path elements, which are filled uh, with this kind of unexciting gray color. Now we can unfortunately use the CSS background image property to provide um, uh, the fill, uh, to fill the path areas. In SVG, path backgrounds have to be defined using the SVG pattern element, which we're gonna take a look at. So MDN pattern. So pattern, element defines a graphics object which can be redrawn and repeated um, and sort of tiled to cov cover a certain area. Now the pattern element 
um, are defined inside the, the, the deaths element, DEFs, up here, which is a special element that's used for graphical objects that aren't actually rendered, but use a sort of reference to, to use later on. Um, so each pattern that we define has an ID and various dimension details. Inside the pattern element, we decide what it actually is composed of. And in our case, we're looking um, to create a pattern out of an image. So for the sake of demonstration and just to have a starting point to get this working, I'm going to add a pattern to our markup, straight in our markup here. Uh, so we open SVG and provide that DF's attribute uh, element, a pattern in there, which has a single image element and that references a color wheel. Now, the way that this works is if I select a path element, this one here, and I change the fill tribute to reference um, the ID of our pattern, reuse, I think I called it, just called it reuse, then you see the pattern shows up um, filling that boundary instead of that gray color. And we can manipulate the sort of dimensions of our pattern by uh, changing the attributes here, right? I have to do it again because I just refreshed. And that fill URL reuse. So this is relevant as we're going to have to scale our pattern to match the, the size of the boundary in order to be able to see the, 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 the trademark imagery um, as best we can from, from the map. Um, now there are some images that are bigger than others and they are different aspect ratios. So getting this right, really, you need to kind of edit by hand. Um, unfortunately, that's gonna take you quite a lot of time, over 120. So the approach I took is just to more or less follow something similar to what we did with the text labels and just calculate the size of the boundary, the bounding box, and then um, and then tweak it with a, a function from there. But of course, uh, before we get onto that, we're gonna to need to add a pattern element with an image for each and every uh, trademark that we have for our boundary areas. To do so, what we need to do will look like this, right? We need to select our defs. Um, so that's our defs element. And then perform a data join with our trademarks oh, and join that to pattern elements. So this uh, this this way of expressing the join here is pretty much the same thing as doing data um, and then enter then append. Um, what this will do in D three it will also handle update and exit. So if we update trademarks and remove one for whatever reason, or we decide to update the data in it, um, join will also handle those events, but we're not really gonna be doing anything like that just now. And um, what I need to check just now, we've selected deaths, we've, oh, I'm missing one, vital part here, I need to call select all on pattern, right? So we need to first check whether we actually have any patterns to join to. Um, then that selection, we try to join trademarks. If there aren't any in there in that selection, then we'll add, it will append pattern elements. Um, otherwise it doesn't, it won't do anything, right? So um, I'm gonna check the markup here and we should now have lots of pattern elements in there, in our defs element. So I'm looking at SVG, defs, and now we have lots of pattern elements. They're just empty, right? 
Um, and we have our example pattern element that we added earlier. So now, I'm going to add in some code I wrote earlier that will help us achieve a few things. Um, first off, provide an ID based on the postcode area because we're going to need to um, reference these patterns later on and set up a couple of scaling um, attributes. Now, earlier I mentioned adding in a scale modifier. I will come back to that and just set fix um, a 25 by 25 uh, pattern size for the moment. So this gives us our patterns, right? Um, and we should each have, whoa. so we've already got our patterns. We just need to prepare them, right? So we've got pattern with an ID and then various attributes with them. Now, the next thing we need to do is to append images to each of them. But before I do so, um, I would like to just make sure that my patterns are working out right. So what I'm going to do is append a rectangle and fill it with a color. Uh, oh, we need to call this patterns, right? So all the patterns that we've selected. And I'm going to append a rectangle to the pattern, fill it with a color of the same size as the pattern, right? Um, to check that our patterns are working out. So um, the next step is to get these areas to reference these patterns. And we should see our color that we've chosen here um, appearing uh, <clears throat> as part of the pattern. So to do so, I need to, on appending those boundaries, set the fill to the ID of the pattern, just like we did with those circles. So I'm, I'm lost here. Where did I do that? I did this over here, because we're filling with this gray, right? So if I say white, um, it will refresh the map. There we go, okay. So this is has now got to become, uh, has to address our IDs. Now the IDs are dynamic. Um, they're based on the data that we have in here, right? And this is a little bit like with the boundary groups. We're, we're, we've got, uh, we're using the, very much the same method here. I don't think I gave it a prefix. Um, the ID is very much just the the postal area code. All right. Oh, okay, okay. I think it, it, this looks good. This looks good. This looks good. Let me just double check. Um, if I tweak the color here, I didn't really change it very much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've got a minty map. Let's get away back to our kind of wheat color. And now we have, um, we've set up our patterns, right? Um, but we want our patterns to have images. Um, so we're gonna go patterns, append image. Now the image has to source uh, the trademark images. Now I've <clears throat> um, I've already downloaded these images and hosted them on my own site. So I did this with a script that just identified um, you sorry used the ID of the trademark image and then uh, combine that with the URL that you will 
uh, you'll see as kind of standard, there's a standard pattern that the intellectual property office have. So um, they're, remember, they're not all, they don't all have images, but there is about, there must be about 80 or so images in this data set. So I have those hosted elsewhere. And for the purposes of um, uh, setting the source, I've written this get image URL function, which looks like this. Um, I guess ideally what I could have done is to update the JSON file um, so that I wouldn't have to do this, but uh, uh, yeah, I forgot to do it anyway. So um, the way that this works is use URL base. So there's a folder where I've got all these images. Um, I'm following the same um, naming convention that the that they've, they've got on on the um, on the intellectual property office site. So the following the base of this, it just sort of appends the um, the latter part of the trademark ID and then a dot PNG on the end, and it will go and fetch them. Um, I'm going to shift this up to the top where we've got our other constants. As that doesn't need to, we don't need, we really need to wait to define these uh, these variables. So back down here. Um, now we don't see any images. We need to provide some uh, attributes. Okay, excellent. We're starting to see some. We're starting to see some. Um, some images appear. Why don't we open this in a slightly bigger window? All right, excellent. We're, we're looking quite good. Looking quite good. I'm actually quite happy with the sizing. Uh, I, my map was zoomed in a bit. Yeah, okay, that's the sizing. That's the kind of scaling we have. Um, there's some repetition going on, but we can start to see some of the imagery here, which is great. Now, I mentioned that we would like to scale, we would probably like to scale our, um, <clears throat> our imagery based on the kind of screen size. So I've come up again, this is a bit of an arbitrary function here. Um, but Kind of works for what we're doing. I mean, ideally, there are a lot more sophisticated ways of doing this. I mean, the scale could also be, should probably also be based on the size of the boundary itself. And um, so you could use the, I mean, you could have a look at the bounding box um, to get an approximate size of, of the boundary area. Uh, I'm looking at the docs here and there is path.area function which uh, returns a much more accurate area of the actual boundary itself. And so that would really be the best way to uh, determine an area rather than just drawing kind of a square around it. Let's have a look at our map just to uh, see how our scaling and um, multiplier worked out there. Let's have a look. And so if I zoom in a little bit, let's have a little look. It's looking good. I can start to see um, some of the imagery there. But the text is definitely looking a little bit too small. We could do with manipulating the text size, uh, making it a bit larger relative to how much space there is around it. So I'm going to jump back to the code. And what I have here in this comment, I'm going to undo is reveal a little bit of how we could uh, really uh, reveal a little bit of code that shows us that area function, right? We use it just like we did centroid. So we're passing in the geographic data that was bound to the uh, the group. 
And what we then do is divide it by the length of the text and come up with a kind of per character area that um, that it could potentially fill. Um, and then I scale that down, right? Because there's obviously, this is, this is kind of crude in the sense that, um, you know, really our text is only going to just fill along horizontally, whereas um, the area might be large because it's it's a tall area or whatnot. So uh, not exactly um, exact, but in any case, a lot better than what we had before. So let's check this out. So I'm going to refresh and voila, we've got a much better let's say relative sizing of text to area going on here so fewer letters big area big text big area uh sort of medium text over here um this one's fitting quite well they could all do with being moved over a little bit with our zero our zero center origin for the text at the moment but i think you get the idea i'm gonna actually just leave things here because improving this map really now is is really just a case of using some of the functions we've been looking at already and tweaking by eye and by our well, knowledge of mathematics and writing functions. If this video has helped you, uh, let me know by leaving a comment or getting in touch with me on social media. One last thing, do you take a look at the code for the finished visualization because it has some of the extra bits and pieces of polish that I've added to make that interactive as well. So there are some um, zoom interactions and uh, click interactions in there as well, which you might like to check out. Um, until next time, thank you very much.